perfectly honest, um, I've never really totally understood this story, and I'm using this one because of that, so that we can start from a place where at least one of us doesn't really understand it, and we can sort of help each other. I read this once a decade ago, so I liked it, and I kind of remember it, but it was 10 years, so I don't know really what's going on either. Okay, so I think that, um, I think that the sort of reason this story is so popular is because, first of all, it's a really good example of Hemingway's read between the lines style of writing, and also because, like, trying to figure out what they're talking about is sort of like a zing, surprise, sort of, mm -hmm. like, like a magic trick if you can figure it out almost, and right. it's sort of fun. But I don't think it was that hard to figure out what they were talking about. Um, I think, obviously, she's contemplating having an abortion, or he at least wants her to be contemplating having an abortion. I agree. Um, and I think that getting that is all fine and well, but there has to be more to it than that. Right. But that's where I sort of am like, um... Yeah, I agree. Um, well, why don't we start at the beginning? Okay. I, one of the first things I noticed was how they refer to the characters, because they don't really use names. They maybe use a nickname later in the story, but they're in, the characters are introduced as the American and the girl in the first paragraph. Uh -huh. And what struck me about that is that the, the main female character is referred to as a girl. And then a couple of paragraphs later, the waitress is referred to as the woman. Yeah, and I wouldn't have thought anything about girl except in contrast to woman. And so that makes it seem like more of a distinct choice that he's, that Hemingway's calling the title, well, I'm sorry, not the title character, but the main character a girl. Right, and girl suggests youth, innocence, inexperience. Um, it makes her seem more vulnerable. vulnerable. So uh, I, I noticed that right away as I was reading. Uh, and then later in the second paragraph, um, you see that um, when the beer glasses are put on the table, the woman, who's the waitress, the waitress looks at the man and the girl. Again, not the, not the boy and the girl, but he's a man, so it suggests that he's older than her, he's more experienced than her. Right, if this story were about a boy and a girl, I would feel like they were both sort of in a bad spot, whereas the man and the girl makes it, it, makes it seem like he has more power in the relationship than, and she, as compared to her. Right. Um, Go ahead. On this first page, really the only thing that, I mean, that's good stuff, but I didn't see that until you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. um, mostly I was just noticing how much tension there was between them. Like, at the end, she, she's commenting, oh, the hills look like white elephants. Um, and obviously that's important because it's the title, but I don't totally understand what that means yet. We can get to that later, maybe. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're sort of snapping at each other. She's just, like, making comments, making sort of, like, bland conversation. And he's like, oh, fine, well, you know. Right. Where, where he says, just because you say I wouldn't have doesn't prove anything. We both have the word tension yeah. written on the page. They're, they're already fighting, and they're fighting about nothing. And how would, uh, what underlying tension is right. there? Right, so it suggests that there's something before the story started that's mm -hmm. right. and the one, cause of this. And once you notice that, you, you can look at the very first thing that the man says. She says, what should we drink? And he says, it's pretty hot. And he's not really responding to her. So they're not talking to, to each other, they're talking around each other. Right. So, once you notice the tension, you go back and you can see that there's a little more at the beginning of the story. And they want big beers. They're not messing right. around here. <laughs> right. Okay. So, hey, go ahead. I, this might not be important, but the, at the top of 476, the man called Listen through the curtains. The woman came out from the bar. What the heck does that mean? Why would he call Listen? Um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. That might be a translation thing that he's just calling for his atten for her attention. It might be the same as saying, I figured, hey, you. I figured it was something like that, but I was like, I don't get that. Yeah, I don't really get that one either. 
Um, and then I noticed how quickly they order a second drink. Frankly, I just noticed how much they're drinking throughout the entire story. We're told that the, the train is maybe 40 minutes away, and they have the beers, and then they have the Anise del Toro, and then they order more beers halfway down the second page. Should we have another drink? So they've already gotten through two. And then they order, uh, so they order a third set. And then I think they even order a fourth. And then by the end, the guy has a fifth drink at the bar. In under 40 minutes, they are drinking to get drunk. Right, but she also says that that's all they ever do together is drink. And that, I think, suggests something about their relationship, too. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of sad. I'm not sure where that is, but... All they do is look at things and try new drinks. They don't talk to one another. And then, again, they're fighting over nothing right there when um, she says it tastes like licorice, and then he just sort of says something noncommittal, and then she's snapping at him. Yes, everything tastes like licorice. He says, oh, cut it out. And... You know, there's, there's got to be something else making them fight because the conversation they're having isn't worth that level of tension. And then there's that weird gap in the action where they're ordering their drinks and they say to the woman, the waitress, yes, with water. And then suddenly the drinks are there and, she's, and the girl is drinking them and they taste like licorice and you never see the waitress come back with them. And I was thinking that Hemingway chose to do that because he's that what's kind of what's important in the he's got like this efficiency thing going on in his writing right. And what's important is the conversation. What's important is the interaction between the girl and the man, not seeing the waitress come back and drop off every single drink. So. When the girl says everything tastes of licorice, especially all the things you've waited so long for, like absinthe, I feel like she's talking about something else that we haven't seen in the action of this story. Like, what does it have to do with things he's waited so long for? Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that's, that's referring to one of the things that's happened in their relationship that we didn't get to see. I want to continue, I mean, we don't necessarily have to decide right now, but that's something that I'll keep thinking about, is why that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I, I can't imagine that that's, well, maybe it's just to add tension to the story, but why licorice? Why does everything taste like licorice? Why does everything he waits, for, waits so long for taste like licorice? I don't know. I and maybe this is me reading too much into it, but I imagine that reference as being like something he's waited so long for. He's really waited for absinthe. All they do is drink. Maybe I'm, I'm putting too much into it, but I imagine him having a really bad drinking experience with absinthe. Well, and who she doesn't, had, right? Right. And she had to take care of him, and she's, she was angry with him about it, and her referring to that is sort of bringing up a mistake that he's made in the past that makes him upset, which is why he immediately tells her to cut it out. Yeah, maybe. I think that... I think that that's, that's one of the dangers of this kind of story, though, where he leaves so much out. It's good and suggestive in a way because it allows us to fill in so many details for ourselves, and that, that I think, makes the story more interesting and in some ways more real because we're sort of writing it with him mm -hmm. but I also don't think that that's productive in terms of like really analyzing a, a story or writing about it because I feel like we have to just work with what's there and we can't mm -hmm. write this whole thing about like oh well you know he had a bad experience with absinthe and you can't write that in a paper right and it might be cultural context you know mm -hmm. um, uh, now our, our cultural context we see characters on shows or in books referring to the absinthe incident, right? And, it, and it's a recurring joke, and we never get to see what it was. We just have to imagine that it was really, really funny. But maybe Hemingway doesn't have that cultural context. Maybe, you know, maybe the properties of absinthe are more known to his readers when he's writing this, and there's something about absinthe that we I should be... I thought it was hallucinogenic. I thought that was the green fairy or whatever. 
yeah, Oscar Wilde and uh, Lewis Carroll and all them. But so maybe there's something about absence, some context that we just don't know well enough that would make sense. Well, let's move on. I think we're getting really distracted. Yeah. Okay. So then I think the, the next big important thing down the page is where there's this sudden non sequitur where they're talking about the beer. It's nice, it's cool, it's lovely. And then suddenly he's talking about an operation. Right, and that's where we can finally figure out that it's about an abortion because we know it's an operation and then um, he says, I know you wouldn't mind it. And what kind of abortion, or I'm sorry, not what kind of abortion, but what kind of operation is optional in that way or presented that way like I know you need this brain surgery you're not gonna mind it you know it's right. not a big deal won't you do it for me like you don't talk about normal operations that way the only thing you would talk about that way is an abortion and the suggestion is that she's doing him a, a favor right like plastic surgery wasn't an option back when this story was written so optional operations you know in the first line they could be talking about anything somebody else is sick, is hurt, is dying. You don't know who it is. But by the next line where they're talking about an operation on the girl that she wouldn't mind, it's, it's getting really clear really quick that they're talking about her getting an abortion. Yeah. The phrasing, it's just to let the air in, is weird to me. But maybe that's just another thing that I could, you know, that requires some background research about abortion procedures in the, the language of the time maybe that's something that would actually help Ernest Hemingway's contemporary readers get what's going on more than it does us mm -hmm. um, I like that you know the next line is the girl did not say anything so she's clearly not on the same page as the guy right and I think that whole portion is really interesting because you could make all of his lines one big paragraph. It's not really an operation at all. I know you wouldn't mind it. It's really not anything. It's just to let the air in. I'll go with you and I'll stay with you all the time. But Hemingway doesn't do that. He breaks it up and points out that the girl's looking at the ground, that the girl didn't say anything. And those, the way the story is structured, those are opportunities for her to say anything. And Hemingway is making it clear that she's choosing to be quiet. She's making right. a, a, a distinct choice. She's not just letting him talk. She's choosing to be quiet, and it shows that she's upset. It's the equivalent of a line of dialogue. Right, and that makes his dialogue seem more desperate, like he's repeating himself. It's fine. Silence. No, really, it's fine. Right. So clearly she's not into this idea. It's not that they've decided this together. It's that he's pushing her towards it. Right. And then that line, we'll be fine afterward, just like we were before. Um, he's saying that something's changed in their relationship. And that, I think, is what's telling us, you know, that this is the source of the tension that came earlier in the story. That before, they had a, a very relaxed or very fun relationship. It was positive in some way. And now, they recognize that, they're, that this, the pregnancy and the possibility of abortion, has is, is brought this negativity into their relationship. Or at least it has from his perspective. Mm -hmm. And then I also think it's interesting that she says, and you think then we'll be all right and happy. Because at the bottom of 476, because she's not sure about it. And is that line that she's hopeful that they'll be all right and happy again, that their relationship will go back to before? Or is she sad? because she disagrees with him? Is she being sarcastic? Oh, and then you'll think we'll be all right and happy? Or is she sad that they have to do this in order to be all right and happy? And then on 477, so I said the girl, afterward they were all so happy. Like, if she really thought that all the people she's known who've done this were happy afterwards, she wouldn't be so hesitant. I feel like she's trying to convince herself or she could, that line could be sarcastic, and afterwards they were all so happy. Right, that's a really interesting line if she's saying it sarcastically. Um, even if she's saying it earnestly, that afterward they were all so happy, 
she might be setting herself apart from those girls in that situation. They were the type of girls who would all be so happy about it, but maybe she's not that type of girl. I think this would be, I think there's a lot of interesting ambiguity here, and that's maybe one of the important parts about this and how it's written, like if we're talking about author's choices. I think that it's not so much, I think one of his choices is to not talk, not talk about it, because in a lot of ways they're not talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the ambiguity of the things they're saying sort of shows maybe their uncertainty. I think the story really is interesting because it puts us in both the position of the man and the position of the girl because each of them is trying to figure out what the other wants and neither of them is coming out and saying it and each of them is trying to parse the other's words and figure out well what do they mean well what do they really mean well what do they really feel and we're sitting in the middle trying to do that for both of them I like this conversation they have at the bottom of page 477 mm -hmm. where he says we can have everything again basically right and she says, yeah, no, we can't. And they sort of just go back and forth. Yeah, we can have the whole world. No, we can't. We can have everything. No, we can't. And I feel like they're talking about different things there. I think for him, everything is like freedom, um, particularly freedom from the responsibility of having a child, freedom to look at things and drink and party and, you know, to travel things whatever it is because he's an American and they're clearly mm -hmm. abroad things that he wants and she wants him and the baby she can't have both right so when she's saying we can't have everything she's saying well the everything that I want is you and a baby and a family and to be together and if he doesn't want the baby then she can't have that everything she has to choose between one or the other but I was also wondering if the everything might mean something else, like the love that she felt for him before has somehow, that the purity of it has somehow been spoiled by her knowledge that this is what he wants, that she saw him as a particular type of person, and now she can never see in that before. Once they take it away, you can never get it back. Now that she has this knowledge of who he really is, she can never love him the same way. Right, or that it could be the baby. Once they take the baby away, you can never get it back. Right, that's not a decision she can undo. Right. And even if they decide to stay together and have another baby in the future, then that makes this all the more terrible in some ways, that she can never get that baby back, Now, in, even though they decide to, to be together. It's a really sad conversation. And I, I really think it shows that these two are, are on completely different pages. That he wants something in his life and can't understand what she wants. And maybe she can understand what he wants, but she just doesn't like it. Yeah, and I think that this conversation, on one level it's what are they talking about, on the next level it's oh, they're talking about this abortion. On the next level, I don't think they're talking about that at all. I think that the problem is that they don't want the same thing, and they're realizing that. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the bottom of that page, You've got to realize, he said, that I don't want you to do it if you don't want to. I'm perfectly willing to go through with it if that means anything to you. And she says, doesn't it mean anything to you? We could get along. And, like, he's, his language, you know, that he's willing to go through with it is very hesitant. Like, he guesses he'll do it for her if, she, if he has to. But it's sort of like one of those fake promises, like he's, um, like he's trying to call her bluff. Right. And, but that it's ultimately like a burden to him if it means something to you. And she's like, okay, of course, it, you know, like the idea that it means something to her is sort of unspoken, like, like, of course it does. And she says, why doesn't it mean anything to you? What she wants is for him to want the baby. Yeah. And whether or not they keep the baby, she can't make him want it. And I think that's what's saddest for her. Mm -hmm. I also think there's an interesting contrast that he wants, in that long conversation, 
He wants everything. He wants the whole world. But the way that she phrases what's going to happen if they keep the baby, we could get along. And it, it's sort of like getting, getting by. He doesn't want to get by. He wants to have everything. Um, and I think he, he sees the so baby. So are definitions of what everything is. Mm -hmm. And then on the next page, he says, of course it does, but I don't want anybody but you. I don't want anyone else, and I know it's perfectly simple. So he's saying, okay, but he wants her, but he doesn't want the baby. He doesn't want anybody else. He's not saying he doesn't want any right. other women. And I mean, he is, but he's also saying, listen, we're fine as a twosome. We don't need to add anything to this. Yeah, I don't want anybody but you is a romantic thing when you're saying that I don't want other women. But it's sort of a horrible thing to say to somebody who's pregnant. And then I think her next line, yes, you know it's perfectly simple. I definitely think that's sarcasm. And I think it's a great contrast to earlier on when he says, um, just because you say I wouldn't have seen an elephant doesn't prove anything. And he's mad at her for trying to put words into his mouth or trying to define who he is by, by saying things. But then that's all he does to her through the entire story. Is sort of he tries to badger her into doing what he says because he insists that it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, it's going to be perfectly simple. And finally, she sort of calls him out on it. You know it's going to be perfectly simple, but you're not the one who has to have the operation. It's ha it's happening to her, not him. And then there are a lot of points in the story where I've written liar right next to what he says, where she says, "Would you do something for me now?" And he says, "I'd do anything for you." Well, anything except have a baby with you and settle down. Liar. Right. Or when he says he doesn't mind it because, or, you know, that if he doesn't, he doesn't want her to have the, the operation if she doesn't want to. He's lying there, too, because he says, you know, there's another silence. She says, will you please, 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 please stop talking. And then he doesn't say anything. And then he blurts out, but I don't want you to. I don't care anything about it. I'm assuming there that what he he doesn't want her to have the baby. He doesn't care anything about the baby. Because I agree. we know he wants her to have the operation because he's been pushing for it the whole time. So he can't be talking about that. Right. There's a definite difference between his words and his actions. He's saying you don't have to have the operation if you don't want to with his words, but in his actions when he keeps returning to the subject, he's trying to convince her to want to have the abortion. So his, his words say, well, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But his actions say, I want you to decide to have the abortion. Okay, so the train. Um, the train's a metaphor for the birth, I think. Or the, either the baby itself, that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Or the, or the decision itself, it's coming, it's coming. The decision to, to choose that they have to choose one way or another whether or not to have the baby, or right. the baby itself that in action I think it's, it's yeah, gonna arrive. I think you're right. I think it's the baby itself. I think that makes more sense than the decision, because if he doesn't talk her into it, then it's going to be too late, and the baby's just going to be here. Right. They've got a limited time to make their decision. Um. And then in the last paragraph, uh, he stops at the bar and gets another drink and looks at all the other people. And these people are waiting reasonably for the train. That really stuck out to me. And I think it's because he thinks that the, the girl is waiting unreasonably. That all these other people are, are doing reasonable things and they're waiting for a train and they're going to go travel. But this girl is, you know, there's this impending thing and she's being unreasonable about it. Why doesn't she just go have the operation? She's being unreasonable in her actions, and he seems to think the rest of the world, and him specifically, is being reasonable. How, how about the last line? I think she's either shutting down the conversation, like when people say, what's wrong, and they say, oh, but clearly something's wrong. Something's obviously wrong. Or she's maybe decided through the force of the argument that she's just going to have the baby and do what she wants. Because she can't have what she wants either way, so she might as well have the baby. 
and the idea of like an operation implies that you're sick or that something's wrong with you. But she's fine. You know, if she wants if she wants to have the baby, then she's great. You know, of course she's fine because she's pregnant. Isn't that wonderful? But I don't know. I think it's ambiguous again. And I like ambiguous, but so. What about the title? Um, I think the title's interesting for a couple of reasons. I think the gentle slopes of hills, you know, it's not mountains like white elephants, it's hills. And I think that image of the gentle slope evokes a pregnant woman's baby belly. And elephants are just large. Also, so are pregnant women. Right, and I would want to look up the phrase the elephant in the room and For when sure. that was. Um, because that's Coined. totally... Yeah, exactly. exactly. Right, because if that was popularized before this story, this is definitely a story about an elephant in the room. Um, I also noticed, talking about the hills, there are only a few places where there's description of them. And the one is on page 477, where she stands up and she looks outside and she sees fields of grain, trees, the banks of the river, the river again, uh, fields of grain, the river, and trees. And these are all growth, life, water, fertility. They're, they're images that's, of life. It's, a, it's an idea of what she's talking about. Right, and then that's, that leads right into the conversation where he says, we can have everything, and she says, no, we can't. And I think at that point, when she's looking, I think she's seriously considering that she's going to keep the baby. She's, that she's not going to be bullied anymore, that she's going to keep the baby. And I think that having that description lead into the last page where she says there's nothing wrong with me, I think that suggests she's going to keep it. So if you were writing a paper about this, what would you write about? Um, I would write about the last line, because I think that there's also a reading of it where she might be in denial that I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. And when she's denying that there's a problem or that there's anything wrong in their relationship, if she's denying that there's anything wrong in their relationship, she's choosing to keep the relationship and not the baby. If she's denying that there's anything wrong with her body, that she has a baby growing, then she's choosing to keep it. And I think the, the que that which decision is she making at the end is very powerful. And I think it can be argued either way, but I would go back to the fertility image halfway through the story and say that she's choosing to keep it, as opposed to at the beginning of the story, when the hills are white in the sun and the country is brown and dry, that's bad imagery at the beginning of the story. I think at the beginning of the story, she's she's maybe leaning more towards having the abortion. And that as he badgers her more and more, she realizes what kind of person he is and realizes that but she doesn't want to be But the abortion won't with him. actually give her back the relationship because he keeps saying that it will, and she's consistently doubting him. She's consistently doubting him. She sees what sort of person he is. That even if she gets the relationship they had back, that the ultimate end of that relationship that she always wanted to have a baby with him is something he's never going to want. So I think then when she sees the fertility imagery, she sees that the better choice is to keep the baby. Like you said, because then at least she'll have the baby. And then by the end, when there's nothing wrong with her, she's deciding to keep it. That's the paper that I would write. Okay. I think I would write about how my thesis would be something like, most people look at this story and say, they're clearly talking about an abortion. But I would talk about how they're talking about more than that, and they're talking about their relationship and what the baby means that it's not just about whether or not they have the baby it's about what he wants and what she wants and how that's fundamentally not the same thing and the baby's brought that to light so the baby is the lens that focuses the light on the relationship so i think we, we're writing the same concept in a lot of ways but maybe through different textual objects because yeah. i would probably focus on the conversation that they have 